Okay. Is that all on me? Uh, first, I want to talk about my relationship uh, to SMU. Uh, this comes from someone who didn't cross the Delaware River until after, uh, after his graduation from college. Uh, are there people in the audience who the number 37 means anything to? <laughs> I grew up in Jersey City. Uh, I thought America was an Italian country governed by the Irish, <laughs> and, which was, was all I knew. And I think we were the only Protestant uh, family uh, in town, as far as I could tell. Uh, and then in those days, the great days, number 37, Doak Walker, uh, Kyle wrote, er, I, in my undistinguished, very undistinguished athletic career, I always had the number 37 because Doak Walker was my idol. Uh, I had, didn't really know what, who Methodists were, but <laughs> uh, the big football game, at that time, college football, was bigger than professional football, much better. It was an extraordinary time because many of these people, including Walker, had served in, the, uh, in World War II so that the average age of those football teams was 25, 26 years old. They weren't kids anymore. Uh, and when, and one of the great rivalries in those days was between SMU, which I had never seen, uh, and Notre Dame. Uh, and everybody that I knew, all my friends, uh, in not the easiest neighborhood in Jersey City were for Notre Dame. So, and I was for SMU, uh, which took a great toll on me. Uh, I grew up a, uh, with a pretty rough bunch, but that's, so it's a delight for me to be here. And I also learned a great deal already about SMU. I kept looking for the tower. And then I found out that the tower was only five foot five. It was John Tower, who, who I knew. But I thought there was something rising up with, uh, uh, called the tower, Tower Center. Uh, I'm going to talk tonight about uh, the subject uh, uh, and largely about scandal and uh, uh, illness in the White House, the health of our presidents and the effect of death uh, on people uh, in power. Uh, I, I first want to give my own view of, uh, of the presidency, which is largely uh, from Ralph Waldo Emerson, that events are in the saddle and ride uh, mankind. Events are in the saddle and ride mankind from, from his writings. I. Uh, in the, the time that I've spent uh, in the White House and, uh, and then writing a series of books about the presidency, uh, I think the single uh, thing that most struck me uh, was how reactive the presidency is. That uh, it is really, no one is prepared to be president, and only 44 men know what's like to be president. I mean, it is, it's sui generis. It's an act of faith that any human being can handle uh, the responsibility uh, that comes to a president of the United States. And it's not, uh, it's not about intelligence or IQ. Uh, probably the three highest IQs, maybe the current president uh, fits in there, but uh, Herbert Hoover, Jimmy Carter, Richard Nixon, uh, all were in one way or another failures uh, as presidents, although they were probably the smartest people uh, to hold the job. The job is about judgment, uh, and it's, uh, we don't pay them by the hour, uh, and we judge them, the presidents, our presidents, by one or two or three big things that happen on their watch. Uh, war, fire, flood, famine, uh, Fort Sumter is being fired on, uh, the Twin Towers are going down, uh, Katrina has hit, uh, Iranian students have grabbed American hostages, the Soviets put missiles 
In Cuba, the banks started failing. What do you do? None of these things were campaign issues. These were the events uh, that defined the presidents who happened to be in office uh, when, they, when it happened. Uh, the, and most of them pretty quickly learned uh, that the job is not running the country. The job is leading the nation, and you do that with words. And the presidents who have succeeded uh, largely succeeded because they were able to articulate uh, what they thought the country should be and, and where it should uh, be going. Uh, people like Lincoln, like Reagan, uh, who were able to communicate on a different level uh, than, many, uh, than many other people. Uh, the, uh, I'm gonna talk kind of in inverse order uh, about uh, uh, scandal, scandals in the White House and, uh, and health. And my own feeling is I researched uh, a good deal on health uh, for, uh, uh, for this night, uh, and I came to a conclusion uh, that uh, scandals affect uh, politics, the politics of the country. And I learned that the health, that the health of the leader affects every one of us. It is much more important, I think, than I thought about it, and, uh, and then scandals. There are many scandals. Uh, I'll even give you the New York Times list of what the most important were, uh, but in the end, they don't define, uh, except perhaps in the case of Nixon, uh, they don't define the presidency uh, the events, unforeseen, surprising, and how presidents handled them are what define a president. No one knows or cares whether Lincoln balanced the budget. Uh, and no one cares if they remember about Pardon Gate, uh, which uh, haunted Bill Clinton for a couple of weeks. It was almost as, it was not as big as Benghazi. Uh, the, and the second, line that I'll follow in talking uh, and that I think I've learned over the years, I don't care what it is, the president knew. Uh, one of the great mythologies uh, that comes out of the White House uh, is that things happen without a president knowing about them. John Kennedy had no idea, according to his people, that his brother was leading a team trying to assassinate Fidel Castro. Uh, even today, uh, now that the chief defender, Arthur Schlesinger, a brilliant fellow, uh, is no longer with us, uh, the, uh, it's possible that uh, Kennedy actually knew uh, these things. And of course, Nixon, as he said, knew nothing of Watergate or of a break-in. Uh, Reagan, Iran-Contra? Iran what was that? I, I don't remember. Uh, Bush? Uh, George W. And, uh, and Barack Obama knew nothing that the NSA was taping, was tapping the phones of everybody in the country. How did, they didn't know about any of this. My, uh, the only possible thing I think a president didn't know about uh, was President Bush, number two, uh, and weapons of mass destruction. It's conceivable to me that he actually didn't. Uh, no, but every other thing, and like Chris Christie in New Jersey, he had no idea that the lanes uh, on the George Washington Bridge were being blocked. Who could be doing this? Uh, the, uh, and when it comes to scandal, uh, we are more tolerant now uh, than we once were about, uh, about these things. Best example, I think, is the checker speech uh, important uh, in the growth of the United States. Uh, it Today, not only today, when Nixon had a slush fund uh, from rich people, all politicians and all presidents had uh, the same thing. Uh, and maybe a president uh, brings out the best and the worst of us, and we decide to, history decides, uh, whether that's the case. The ones who bring out the best uh, live well in history, the others 
the people who bring out the worst in all of us uh, don't. And one of the things about the worst of all of us, I think, is that uh, <coughs> we no longer can be shocked by anything. Uh, it all, uh, it's the same. The, uh, uh, the uh, people are old enough here to remember when people thought a Vicuna coat was going to define uh, uh, Harry Truman as, uh, uh, not uh, Dwight Eisenhower, as president. The Vicuna coat was a gift uh, from a fellow whose name I've forgotten to Sherman Adams, who was then the White House chief of staff, former governor of New Hampshire, and he got a coat from this guy and lost his job over it. He lost his job as chief of staff uh, because some, somebody had given him a coat. And the same thing uh, happens uh, with the checkers speech. Seems the greatest event in the history of the world, and now it makes uh, no difference uh, at all in how we are, how we're governed. By today's standards, those are small things. And one of the reasons, and some presidents, I think, share the blame uh, for this, is that lying and cheating have become endemic to American life. Uh, and the assumption is uh, that everyone does it, and perhaps they do. Uh, people who are in the, what's now called human resources, used to be called uh, uh, personnel, uh, estimate that 40% of the resumes they see uh, are phony. People have exaggerated Wendy Davis. People have uh, exaggerated uh, Gary Hart, who de-exaggerated his age. Uh, and people don't, uh, by nature, most of us, do in fact inflate our background. That's why we like introductions that inflate them. Uh, the, uh, it is, in the last month, one a week, uh, it was uh, revealed uh, that the people uh, manning our missiles in the middle of the country in North Dakota and places like that, Air Force officers were cheating uh, on, they're supposed to be update, update their skills every three months, uh, and they were lying. They weren't doing it. A week later, it turned out that millions of dollars that were appropriated for the Army to uh, recruit more soldiers uh, for our volunteer Army, one of the worst ideas we've ever had, uh, were pocketing the money. At one time, the Army was offering $20,000 per enlistment uh, as they were being eaten up in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places we probably shouldn't have been. And then in the third week, just last week, it turned out that the, uh, the people, the Navy, and the Navy people who were in charge of instructing and of handling uh, nuclear uh, reactors uh, had been faking their backgrounds, their experience, uh, and the fact that they too were cheating on updated tests. There's something wrong uh, with this, and it is, uh, has changed us uh, in in many ways, large and small. The uh, we've developed this uh, culture of apology. Uh, if anyone was offended by what I did, what I said, or what not, I, I'm really sorry. Or mistakes were made. No one made them. Uh, mistakes were made was, is part of Chris Christie's uh, background. So that uh, my feeling is that because of scandal and the press's attraction to it, these are good stories after all, uh, have demeaned and uh, degraded uh, our democracy. Uh, and I think that one of the people who was key to that uh, was President Reagan, who was successful uh, on many ways, who understood the presidency, uh, who was the great communicator. The reason he was a great computer, uh, uh, communicator was that he was dumbing down the country 
with simple ex explanations of extraordinarily difficult problems. So that suddenly his own, what uh, David Owen, uh, the foreign minister of Britain, called uh, his own confident ignorance uh, was transmitted uh, across the body politic, I would argue. Uh, the, I, I tried to check out and did uh, what, were, what were the great scandals, White House scandals uh, of our history? Uh, and on the New York Times website, and uh, I crushed together, we crushed data at USC, uh, New York Times website and Mother Jones, a leftist publication, uh, about what were the greatest of scandals in the country. Uh, far and away, uh, they concluded Watergate, which did have, uh, not only was it irresistible to the public, the way it unfolded, uh, and the man at the center was a man of many votes and many enemies, uh, and was, uh, was destroyed by it, uh, but so was a lot of what Americans thought about the presidency and about democracy and our republic uh, by that scandal and the lies uh, that, uh, that surrounded the attempted uh, cover-up of the event. Of course, as I said, Nixon didn't know anything about it, which made it pretty difficult for him to respond to it. Uh, the, and then the lists are uh, Grant and the Whiskey Scandal, I didn't know anything about Grant and the whiskey scandal, but it turns out they put a tax on whiskey uh, during Grant's administration, and it was being pocketed by mid-level officials who were supposed to be handling the paperwork uh, as it was. Uh, then they thought the NSA revelations uh, of, uh, of our day uh, was high on that list. Uh, I, among other uh, people, I suspect, I'm not upset that that information uh, became public, uh, but I think uh, Edward Snowden should be in jail. Uh, if you want to be a whistleblower, uh, if you want to practice civil disobedience, uh, you have to be willing to pay the price, too. You don't, uh, you don't run away. Uh, if you really believe uh, in what you're doing and believe in its importance. Uh, Monica Lewinsky, God bless her soul, uh, is on the list. Uh, Iran-Contra, uh, which uh, either uh, was the greatest betrayal of a president who says he didn't know anything about it, or at least he couldn't remember anything about it, uh, and, but what it did to us as a people also uh, around the world. The, the worst scandals, I think, are the ones that change, uh, Abu Ghraib being an example, I suppose, change the world's perception of the United States and our own uh, perception of ourselves. What kind of people are we? Uh, the uh, Teapot Dome, none of us in the room, I think, were old enough to remember, but it had to do with uh, selling uh, uh, oil rights in Wyoming for drilling to, to members of uh, President Harding's uh, inner circle and, and cabinet. And then there's a whole category of, you know, forget about it, uh, Billy Gate, uh, Whitewater. Uh, none of these things had any lasting impact on the country except that uh, they showed that there was, there was hypo hypocrisy and lying uh, among the people that we chose uh, to lead us. Uh, the oldest one that makes the list, by the way, is Jefferson uh, and Sally Hemings, but uh, a slave of his who apparently, at least DNA says, uh, was the father, uh, was the mother of at least one child of his. Some accounts say there were as many as six. Uh, the Historically, uh, the New York Times chose 
uh, Andrew Jackson's uh, marriage as the largest historical or non-contemporary uh, scandal. Andrew Jackson was married uh, for 40 years uh, to the same woman, uh, Rachel Jackson, uh, and his political opponents and the press, uh, and sometimes they were this one and the same as they sometimes are today, uh, began publishing uh, stories that Rachel actually uh, had uh, married Jackson before her divorce uh, from her first husband uh, was uh, official. Uh, apparently, she knew nothing about this, uh, but she died uh, two months after Jackson came to the White House, and uh, this champion of populist anger, uh, uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, blamed, he was an angry man, uh, blamed uh, all of that on, uh, on his opponents and, and his populist anger changed the country because of, of her death. And I'll talk about uh, how that affected uh, other people uh, there. The, uh, for some reason, what, what I would think is the, the worst scandal in American history, presidential scandal in American history, was not on any of those lists. And that was the fact that for the last year and a half or so of his presidency, uh, that Woodrow Wilson uh, was not functioning. I know Scott Berg's been here, and he talks uh, a good deal about that in, the, uh, in his really wonderful uh, biography of Woodrow Wilson, who turned out to be a far more interesting fellow than I ever imagined. Uh, and the, but it was literally his wife, his second wife, Edith. He was also a man uh, destroyed uh, by, the, uh, by the death uh, of his first wife while he was president. Uh, the best quote that ever came out of Woodrow Wilson, there were many, was when he left Princeton, uh, where he was president, to become governor of New Jersey. Princeton and Trenton are only about 20 miles apart. But as he left Princeton to take over the governorship of New Jersey, uh, he said, thank God I'm out of politics. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, but it was uh, for more than a year and a half, uh, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson was uh, in a dark room, uh, barely able to speak, paralyzed, and his mother, uh, his wife, uh, Edith, his second wife, uh, and his doctor uh, lied, lied, lied uh, for a year and a half. Now, uh, today, I don't think that could happen. Uh, the technology's involved, and who would, who would believe it? But for a year and a half, the President of the United States was incapacitated totally. That also leads us later on toward the 25th Amendment with the, uh, the fact that uh, the presidency can be turned over to the vice president if there are health crises or uh, 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 that would affect uh, the man's capacity or the woman's one day uh, to govern. Uh, the, which leads me to what I, uh, uh, I think is more important and that is the health uh, of our leaders and the fact that it has been only on rare occasions uh, where presidents have been uh, open about the state of their health in extreme circumstances. Interestingly, they were not completely. They, you know, the lies began, too, in those situations. But interesting, the two, to me at least, the two people most open about their health problems were Dwight Eisenhower uh, after his heart attack uh, in Denver and Ronald Reagan after his, the attempted assassination and then his uh, operation uh, for polyps in his intestines. 
Yeah, I don't think that's a coincidence that it was these two men, because another thing that has impressed me about the presidency, and maybe more than just the presidency, is that there is something to be said uh, for old men who are already famous uh, moving into leadership positions. Younger men uh, are prey, the Bay of Pigs being one of the great examples, uh, to uh, bad advice, to uh, people with separate agendas, and want to, uh, uh, and, and can be lied to more easily. Uh, they can uh, be persuaded more easily. They are more afraid uh, of things like polls and elections uh, than these two old men were. The Eisenhower, uh, famous as a general, and Reagan, uh, famous as an actor. Uh, so I, I will talk about health, and it is no coincidence that with all the wiretapping and electronic uh, buzzing in the world going on, intelligence agencies, a standard tactic for intelligence agencies, not only our own, in other countries as well, is to try to find out, I don't know how to word this exactly, what they want are stool samples uh, of leaders of other countries uh, because they want to know what the health is of those people. So that our CIA uh, and presumably every other intelligence agency uh, often develop these little traps and tried to find someone to get them into the toilets uh, of Charles de Gaulle or, uh, uh, or Len Leonid uh, Brezhnev to find out what the status of their health uh, really was. And frankly, uh, that was a pretty good idea uh, to do that. What we never figured out was that they were doing it to us too. Uh, the, I, I'll talk first about Kennedy's health, which we could you could do a whole weekend on that. Uh, the, I worked uh, with, uh, I mentioned David Owen, Lord, uh, Lord Owen now, who was Foreign Secretary of Great Britain, uh, but uh, also uh, was by trade uh, a neurologist, uh, who wrote a book worth looking at called uh, In Sickness and in Power, uh, about leaders, he's better on British leaders, uh, and, but I uh, did some work with him on John Kennedy's uh, health, uh, which is one of the case studies that he talks about in this book. Uh, and Owen, uh, who had more access because one, he was foreign secretary, and two, he knew what he was looking for and looking at, uh, was uh, uh, had studied the health at, from original records, from X-rays, uh, from EKGs, from brain scans uh, of leaders, uh, from of modern leaders. Uh, and I'll mention uh, Kennedy uh, first. This is Owen's interpretation, and this is why uh, health uh, is important. He wrote a chapter, uh, which I did some of the research on, but I didn't, the conclusion was not uh, necessarily or really mine. He believed that the difference between Kennedy's actions at the Bay of Pigs and his actions during the Cuban Missile Crisis was the fact that his health was so much better uh, in 1962 than it was in 1961. Uh, and that, uh, as most of you probably know, I mean, uh, President Kennedy, uh, well, would take any drug anytime, self-medicated uh, greatly. He had been sick his entire life. Uh, he spent uh, early years in bed. He was well read because he couldn't leave uh, his bedroom because of the effects of, of his health including uh, uh, scarlet fever. Uh, and then he moved on. Once he got moving on around, uh, he, among other things, contracted venereal disease in 1940. Uh, 
But that was not the, uh, the whole story of his life. The Dr. Feelgood episode is, was truly a threat uh, to democracy. Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Feelgood's name was Max Jacobson, and he was a doctor uh, in New York who had quite a Hollywood reputation. He had a lot of famous uh, clients uh, that he was helping through their problems, but the way he was doing it was injecting them uh, with amphetamines uh, and speed, uh, which was not illegal in 1960 and 60. One, it was controlled, but not against the law. Uh, and uh, he was, uh, his most famous patient, well, unknown at the time, uh, was, uh, uh, the patient was called Mrs. Dunn in his records, uh, but Mrs. Dunn uh, was John F. Kennedy. And, uh, and Mrs. Dunn would call regularly, uh, and Max Jacobs and Dr. Feelgood with his uh, amphetamines would be flown down to the White House uh, by a photographer named Mark Shaw, who died of amphetamine poisoning. He was a patient and also a pilot, uh, a great photographer, but short life. Uh, so that, and in a separate plane, when Kennedy was, was in bad enough shape, uh, he th Jack Kennedy, like most uh, politicians, and certainly like most presidents, think that one-on-one -on -one they will always prevail. Whatever the subject, uh, uh, whatever the goals, that they could defeat any other person uh, in important matters. Well, Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev, was a politician too, and he thought that too, and, uh, and bested uh, John Kennedy at the Vienna summit, uh, and uh, the you, me, the taxpayers had paid to fly alone uh, in a plane, Max Jacobson and his wife, uh, to be at Vienna so that he could uh, inject uh, Kennedy uh, between, uh, between sessions with Khrushchev. Uh, he, uh, and that plane alone, I actually did the research on that and found out from Air Force records uh, and hotel records that Max Jacobson was in Vienna, which, which was denied many times up to then. Uh, <coughs> so that, and Kennedy's health and his pain, on one hand, he was a man of great courage. He was in pain almost all the time. He looked like a god, but he was a wreck. And as his brother, Robert, said, if a mosquito bites my brother, he dies. it's the mosquito who dies uh, because of the diseases, particularly Addison's disease, uh, which at the time uh, Kennedy uh, was diagnosed with it, again in 1940, was a terminal disease uh, and could be treated only by cortisone his father, they had a great deal of money, had, you needed live cortisone, which uh, his father had frozen uh, all over the world. Jack Kennedy had gotten the last rites of the church, uh, of his church, the Catholic Church, uh, three times uh, before and during uh, his presidency. And uh, one of them, the, the, uh, he was on his way to Vietnam, actually, uh, as a, uh, a senator, and uh, he had an Addison's episode, which would have killed him except for the fact that there was frozen cortisone, cortisone live uh, in, a, in a bank in Singapore, where, as there were in banks, safe deposit boxes uh, all over the world, or safes uh, all over the world. Uh, and so that uh, John Kennedy went into the Navy because of the influence of his father and some other people, uh, he never had a, uh, took a physical because there was no way he could have passed uh, any kind of physical. He turned out to be a hero, a genuine hero uh, in the war. Uh, as he, he would, obviously he was good at self-deprecation, but 
uh, talk about, I don't know why they call me a hero, uh, the Japanese ran over my boat. Uh, but the fact is, after the Japanese ran over the, his boat, uh, he swam three miles, uh, taking one of his crewmen. Uh, uh, he had a, his crewman's life vest uh, in his teeth, holding in his teeth, and swam to an uninhabited island, and unfortunately an island without water. Uh, and uh, Kennedy was finally rescued by uh, actually a miracle. Uh, the, uh, he would swim out each night into the channel <clears throat> where both American and Japanese warships were using uh, and with a flashlight try to, sing, uh, to signal them. Uh, and then famously, uh, he carved a message of help in a coconut which got to a, we had, uh, the military had local people uh, on mountaintops who were observers of various kind on what kind of shipping was going on uh, in the Solomons, between the Solomon Islands. I'm sorry, I'm thinking about running for the Senate in Florida. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so that, uh, it is very possible that the uh, Khrushchev had contempt uh, for Kennedy's performance. He liked him. He was a very likable man. Uh, but it, many people believe that the Vienna summit was after the Bay of Pigs, where this young president had been sold a bill of goods uh, by people who were gambling. They didn't think they were gambling that they, they could send this small group of Cubans, relatively small, uh, to the Bay of Pigs, and uh, there, would be an upri there would be a rising of the people of Cuba, and that would be the end of Fidel Castro. Uh, well, we know what happened uh, then, but what happened uh, happened because people like Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA at the time, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, thought that whatever, uh, that no president of the United States would ever let uh, their people be pushed around. And so if they started the conflagration, uh, the Marines would land uh, next. Kennedy uh, didn't do that. He, uh, he did not want to go to war uh, for a variety of reasons, I assume. Uh, but, and so the thing was a total failure well documented to the premier of the Soviet Union. Uh, they then have the Vienna summit. Uh, uh, Khrushchev thinks that Kennedy is a, uh, uh, is a young fool and is pushing him around. Uh, part of the reason Kennedy did so badly in Vienna was that he had a phony resume, uh, including the fact that he said that he had studied at the London School of Economics under Harold Lasky and that he understood Marxism uh, and socialism. He registered, but he never went uh, because he, his back went out and he was uh, sick one more time. But his people didn't know that. I mean, he lied to his own uh, people as well as to the public. Uh, the... Uh, in 1940, he, Janet Travell, who became something of a legend, people, this a dowdy, and dowdish, I guess, if there's such a word, uh, New England doctor, who was in the process of killing Kennedy. Uh, uh, she didn't know it, but she was treating his back with procaine, cocaine injections, uh, which took care of the pain, but was killing his musculature which if you have a bad spine, which he did, uh, you have to depend on your muscles uh, to do the work that in other people might be done uh, by their skeletons. Uh, and uh, he, he was literally saved uh, by his uh, doctor, his official doctor, Admiral Berkeley, uh, and who found a fellow uh, named Hans Krauss, and Hans Krauss, who had been the doctor to the uh, 
Austrian ski team and also was one of the great rock climbers uh, in the world. And I remember when I tracked him down because I was trying to find out about Kennedy's health too, uh, he was living in Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, he was 90 and looked about 65, a healthy 65. And he had this Teutonic, young Teutonic wife uh, who looked like she could break ordinary men. Uh, but I said, why do you live here? Why does someone go to Poughkeepsie when they've got the options? And he went out and we, he pointed up to there are rock mountains behind Poughkeepsie. And he would climb uh, those mountains uh, twice a week at 90. Uh, he was brought to Kennedy uh, secretly. Uh, Hans Krauss, like Dr. Jacobson, when Kennedy may have been promiscuous with women, but women, but he was much more promiscuous with doctors and drugs uh, than he ever was uh, uh, to to assorted women. Uh, as he once said to his brother, when his brother uh, took one of the vials of uh, Kennedy did a lot of self-injection, uh, the vials of uh, amphetamines, and had the FBI. Uh, the uh, lab examined to find out what was in it. And uh, they told him, and he went, Bobby went to his brother and said, you've got to stop taking this. It's going to kill you. And uh, Kennedy said, John Kennedy, the president said, I don't care if it's horse piss. Uh, it makes me feel good, and I'm not going to stop. And he didn't stop until uh, Berkeley and uh, Krauss took over his health as it was, and he began to, it was mainly physical therapy, uh, so that that was the difference in his health between 1961, when he fails at the Bay of Pigs, and 1962, where the world concludes he triumphs uh, at, at the missile crisis. He was simply in better, he was a little more experienced, but he also was at a different place healthily. Uh, sadly, uh, when he was killed here, uh, Kennedy was in the best shape of his life uh, because of uh, because of these people and because he bought in uh, into the exercise and the physical therapy uh, and, as we know, swam uh, every day in a pool which was highly heated. But it was one lie after another. It was amazing how they could get doctors to lie so willingly when Kennedy was running for president and uh, when uh, Lyndon Johnson, who was also running for president, described him as a skinny little kid with rickets. Uh, and then India Edwards, who was the Democratic National Committee woman, uh, held a press conference uh, and said Kennedy had Addison's disease and he was going to die. Well, they denied that all, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, called him a liar, but and he wouldn't have died because, for people who don't feel we should spend money on public health, a doctor in Chicago, a public health service doctor, had uh, uh, had found a way to make artificial cortisone, which meant that Addisonians uh, could uh, could survive. The disease was no longer terminal. Uh, if they could get. He had survived because he was rich and because he could have available uh, live uh, cortisone, which is, comes from sheep in some ways. Uh, the, uh, in 1940, he collapsed uh, in, uh, in London. And uh, the people in London did not know about the artificial cortisone. He was with Pamela Churchill, then married to Winston Churchill's uh, son, Randolph, later married to Averill Harriman, later our ambassador to France, and a good ambassador. Uh, uh, they were friends. The Kennedys had many, many friends, obviously, in England, including the fact that his father, though he left it in kind of disgrace, was the ambassador to the court of St. James. Pamela Harriman, Pamela Churchill, uh, called uh, Churchill's physician, uh, Daniel Davis, and who examined Kennedy, 
and uh, said to Pamela, uh, your young friend has less than a year to live. Uh, and uh, that turned out not to be true uh, because of work done by the public health service here. Uh, now that its budget's being cut, it may not always work that way. Uh, he, uh, he was given the last rites that time. Uh, Pamela called in a Catholic priest who gave him the last rites, but he survived uh, and uh, uh, took, took a boat home uh, and uh, then went into the hospital, which is when he worked on Profiles in Courage uh, with Ted Sorensen. Uh, the, ironically, a failure of the press, and I don't think that would happen today, his, the fact that he was the, one of the first Addisonians to survive after the uh, diagnosis uh, was, uh, there was an article in the American Medical Academy, one of its subset magazines called Management of Adrian Cortical Insufficiency During Surgery. They had warned Kennedy not to have surgery, that he probably wouldn't survive it. He said the pain was so great that he was willing, he'd rather be dead than live in this much pain. Uh, and he was case number three in that article, though his name was not used. But if you read that article, uh, you knew what Kennedy's true health uh, situation was. And apparently many uh, medical people knew, and many medical people uh, were willing to lie about it. Uh, all of, in going through the, the records of presidents, I'll start, Kennedy is the one I obviously know the most about. Uh, I will uh, go back to Lincoln with Almost no exceptions. Uh, our presidents have all had trouble with depression, great trouble. Uh, Lincoln the first, and what Lincoln said uh, was, I can't seem to enjoy life rap rapturously uh, when I'm in company, but when I'm alone, I am so often overcome by mental depression that I dare not carry a penknife. Uh, that story repeats itself uh, again and again in looking at the health records of presidents. Uh, I'm not qualified, uh, and I don't know whether he is, but in his book, uh, Dr. Owen, Lord Owen, uh, uh, said that he thought two presidents, two of our presidents were bipolar, Teddy Roosevelt and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and he had seen, uh, they were both pretty wild guys, and when they were manic, uh, they were extremely effective. Uh, when they were depressed, uh, not so much. Uh, the, uh, there comes then, uh, so that people didn't know as much about medicine, of course, in 1860, uh, and so that it's, it's conjecture to a certain extent about people there. Uh, in 1883, uh, President Grover uh, Cle uh, Cleveland, where, uh, ma, ma, where's my pa? Going to the, the White House, ha, ha, ha. Cleveland, who was elected twice president, not uh, consecutively, uh, was truthful about uh, the fact that he had fathered uh, a kid by a woman uh, a widow uh, in Buffalo, New York, and it saved his political career and he, being honest. Uh, and he was elected a second time uh, president. However, there were things that he covered up and lied about. The most dramatic of them happened uh, in Sag Harbor, New York, where I've lived for a long time. Grover Cleveland in 1883 was strapped to the mast of a sailing ship uh, and half his jaw was taken away in a cancer operation. Uh, and they did it at sea so that he could not, uh, if he was asked the question, uh, did you have an operation in the United States, he could say no. Uh, that he in fact, a Philadelphia paper uh, figured it out that he had had a cancer operation 
it, in today with the cameras and everything else, you couldn't hide something like that, but then you could. Uh, and uh, when the paper in Philadelphia uh, published the story, uh, the White House said that it was totally wrong that the president had a toothache, which he may well have had, but he also had cancer. Uh, so, uh, I'll, I'll, the uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, another president like Kennedy, uh, who who loved to appear physically in uh, uh, in uh, uh, in public, uh, went into deep, deep depression uh, when both his mother and his first wife uh, died within uh, 11 hours. His mother died, and then his wife died in child, after childbirth uh, in 1884. The light has gone out of my life, he said, uh, and uh, and he would not get out of bed then for weeks at a time. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, we, um, we now know, uh, was uh, uh, had uh, was protected by a, a tish, not a tissue a wall of lies about what his health was and the fact that the president of the United States was incapacitated uh, for all that time. Both Coolidge and Hoover. Uh, had depression problems handled uh, by doctors. Uh, Calvin Coolidge slept 11 hours a day, which I guess is what you do when you're depressed. Uh, and it's understandable. When we talk about death, uh, when life strikes or death strikes, my wife died with, with just a year ago. And I couldn't write for more than six months. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't focus, and why should I be any different? Why should Teddy Roosevelt be any different than me? Anybody who has that kind, or almost everybody, I guess, uh, goes into a real uh, non-functioning state, and I certainly did. Then I went back to the book. It's the book about the Japanese internment. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't remember. In a way, you keep a book in your head. You know what you've done and what you haven't done. Uh, when I went back to it, I couldn't remember a thing. I had to start uh, over. Uh, we know that uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, was in a wheelchair. There were 35,000 photos at Hyde Park uh, of Roosevelt as president, uh, and in only two of them is he in a wheelchair, uh, which, as we know now, he was uh, part of. There are people, I, I happen to be doing some work on the, uh, uh, the war in Vietnam, which, uh, which never uh, goes away, but the, you, you can take any president's illness. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt knew he was dying, maybe he was self-deluded, but he was dying uh, in 1944 during that election. And leaders of the party and his friends and his wife uh, were terrified that Henry Wallace, who was the vice president of the United States at the time, who Roosevelt once asked, are you really a communist? This is what they're saying about you, true, are you a communist? Uh, I don't know what Wallace answered, but I know what uh, Roosevelt asked. Uh, if he had not gone to Truman, there, you could uh, have all sorts of scenarios involving things like the Cold War and uh, Vietnam, which it's impossible to believe that if Henry Wallace had stayed in office, uh, we would have, the, the same, history would have taken uh, the same path. Uh, Eisenhower, we talked about the heart attack in Denver, uh, but which he talked about and allowed himself to be photographed in a robe, in a uh, wheelchair, and what he said at the time was, uh, the doctors have given me a parole, if not a pardon. He was quite honest about that attack. Later attacks, he was not quite so honest about. Uh, when Lyndon Johnson was president, uh, he, two of his assistants, uh, Dick Goodwin, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin's husband, uh, and Bill Moyers, who was the young man closest uh, to Johnson, but independently, without either of them knowing it, uh, 
went to see psychiatrists because they thought the president, Lyndon Baines Johnson, had gone crazy. Uh, and what should they do about that? Uh, Richard Nixon, we know the story. Uh, he uh, had a huge drinking problem and made many decisions, some of them very bad, uh, while he was very drunk, although his inner circle basically hauled him in an Ehrlichman. They may be villains in some ways, but they, uh, uh, they tried to protect him uh, against himself. James Schlesinger, who was the Secretary of Defense at the time, uh, called a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and told them uh, that unless they unanimously, and he approved of it, that they were to take no military action uh, because the president will call you in the middle of the night to bomb someone. Uh, whether he did or not, I don't know, but his own uh, staff worried about it. Uh, finally, uh, I, I go to President Reagan, and what David Owen said of him was, uh, it was very hard to assess his mental capacity because of his self-confident ignorance and charming self-deprecation. Uh, it, uh, uh, and, and I, however, having seen his brain scans, Owen says that he did not have Alzheimer's uh, when he was in the White House, that the Alzheimer's set in later. He had the ordinary dementia that most people uh, of any age do. Uh, the, uh, so I'm going to leave, uh, I'm going to leave it there, uh, worrying that we're becoming uh, numb to lying and to cheating uh, in this society. Uh, and uh, that's, and if I offended anyone, I want to apologize. <laughs> Thank you.